today we are going to see how to generate random variates in a simulation using the Monte Carlo methods. As you know, in simulation, we have to have a way to generate values from a particular random variable distribution. And the way we do that is with Monte Carlo sampling. This numerical technique goes back pretty far. Uh, the name Monte Carlo is the code name applied to a piece of the Manhattan Project uh, that was top secret and involved this, uh, these techniques. Um, and in fact, the increasing popularity of Monte Carlo methods is what spurred the, it was the stimulus for the development of pseudo-random numbers and pseudo-random number generators uh, that we talked about in the last uh, lecture. Um, because there was so much in, in terms of using Monte Carlo sampling, it totally uh, exploded. And using real random numbers from um, on a magnetic tape or um, entered in some way into the program that was used to generate the sampling methods um, just wasn't going to cut it anymore. It, it ended up being um, too inefficient, and so it, it was actually the the ex popularity of Monte Carlo sampling that caused all the work that's been going on in uh, pseudo random number generators. We know that the word simulation is sometimes used uh, interchangeably with Monte Carlo sampling. Uh, but in this course, and in particular in this lecture, I want to maintain the distinction between simulation and Monte Carlo methods. Uh, simulation is um, experimenting with a model, a version of reality. And Monte Carlo methods are particular uh, branch of uh, mathematics and used to it's a mathematical technique used to solve uh, mathematical or statistical problems and um, specifically it's a numerical technique an algorithmic uh, technique um, and when you the term Monte Carlo simulation actually is a distribution sampling it uses repeated sampling uh, from um, a dis the distribution of interest um, to determine properties of some phenomenon, well, probably because we're going to be summing or, or getting an average, getting parameters, getting estimates of the distribution. Um, and, and as we know, uh, simulation is a broader technique, and especially discrete event simulation, which is what we're studying in this course, involves a time element, um, and is definitely uh, distinguished from Monte Carlo sampling, which is um, a moment in time. It's a, it's a cross section, but a moment in time that it doesn't move over time. It's a distribution that's being sampled from repeatedly, but the distribution doesn't change. Sometimes the term Monte Carlo is used in the sense of uh, employing randomness or uh, probabilistic activity in order to solve problems that might be deterministic in principle. Uh, sometimes we might uh, know the, the distribution and, and therefore we can sample from it. Uh, but if we want to solve for the mean, the parameter of the distribution, it may not be possible or, or it may not be easy to do it using uh, expected value like we would in, in, uh, when, when we, we can do it. Um, so if the mean is intractable, it's very easy. You get an estimate of the mean by many, many, many repetitions of sampling from the distribution of interest and then uh, summing them up and dividing by the number uh, uh, in the sample, just like you, you do it in any field test. Um, we could call it a probabilistic and numerical approach to solving something that should be solvable analytically. Um, and actually, one of the earliest uses of Monte Carlo methods was to, to empirically get the approximate value of pi. And of course, uh, um, today, in starting back from uh, the advent of large computers, Monte Carlo methods have been tied to computer programs, uh, uh, unlike uh, the historical Monte Carlo methods in the 1700s, let's say, or the 1800s. These are some examples uh, that are trying to show you a distinction between simulation uh, and Monte Carlo methods and then Monte Carlo simulation, where 
Uh, simulation is said to be uh, drawing one pseudorandom um, uniform uh, variate uh, on zero one to simulate the tossing of a coin, one coin. If the value that you get is, obviously it's a value between zero and one, if you get a value less than or equal to 0.5, let's say the coin is heads. If the value is greater than 0.5, let's say it's tails. Uh, this is definitely a simulation and we've done things like this in class, but it's not a Monte Carlo simulation. Now, a Monte Carlo method might be, an example of that might be, let's take a whole box of coins, pour them out, and then figure out the ratio of uh, heads uh, to, versus tails. And that might be a Monte Carlo method of determining what happens in repeated coin tosses. But it's not a simulation, it's, just, it's repeated sampling. A Monte Carlo simulation perhaps, um, drawing a large number of pseudo-random variables from the interval from uniform 0, 1, assigning values less than or equal to 0.5 as heads, greater than 0.5 as tails, um, and it's, it's like repeatedly tossing the coin. Um, personally, I, as you know, I'm, I wouldn't call it a Monte Carlo simulation, but rather Monte Carlo sampling, and we use it in simulation all the time. But I got this from Wikiwand, and I wanted to be true to the source. All right, so let's learn about Monte Carlo methods. Um, these are uh, techniques that we use when we want to generate data. Uh, we need, what do we need for that? We need a random number generator. And we need the cumulative probability distribution for um, the distribution that we want to generate these values from. We assume in this uh, endeavor, we assume that we have a source of random numbers that come to us in uniform between zero and one. We've got this stream of uniform zero one random numbers um, it exists, it's usable, it's not going to break down. That's the, the assumption all of this is based on. Where do we get the random numbers from? A table of random digits, a roulette wheel, some kind of probabilistic activity, more than likely today uh, from a computer program, an app uh, that's going to generate these random numbers, uh, which as we know, because we already studied them, are really pseudo-random numbers. To illustrate Monte Carlo methods, we're going to use the inverse transform technique. It's easy to understand, easy to demonstrate. Um, it may not be the best technique around, uh, especially in terms of efficiency, but it it's definitely works and it's easy to, to understand and easy to explain. Uh, first, you need the cumulative prob probability distribution function. Uh, like the, the graph that you see on the slide in front of you. Um, you, use, you, you use your random number generator to get a random number between zero and one. You, uh, you, whatever your, uh, whatever your what, for whatever reasons, whatever your justification, decide how many decimal places you want and uh, your, you generate a number between zero and one. Uh, use a, a random number generator and a uniform, uh, apply a uniform zero one distribution. Um, and you can see the blue lines on that graph. Well, a random number between zero and one would be a value on the y axis. Wherever that lands out, we hang a horizontal line to the curve and then hang a vertical line down. Um, so that then we can pick out the value of x that corresponds to that uh, uniform zero one random number. Very, very simple, easy to understand process. Uh, the next step is um, that's x. That's a, really, that's the whole thing. X is the, the sample value. Um, and then you repeat over and over again until uh, you have the sample size that you're interested in. So here's how we would use the inverse transform method to sample values from the exponential distribution uh, with a particular uh, parameter. 
Uh, the, the cumulative exponential distribution is on the graph in front of you. Again, the vertical axis is um, f of x, or in other words, a, a number between 0 and 1. It's a cumulative probability distribution. It's going to be a number between 0 and 1. And um, the x-axis is values from this exponential distribution. Maybe it's times. Maybe it's um, inter-arrival times in your simulation. Um, the formula for the cumulative uh, distribution function in the, of the exponential distribution is listed there, 1 minus e raised to the power of negative lambda x. And uh, this is, so that how do we figure out x? Obviously, we don't want to do it with graph paper. Um, first of all, we won't be as accurate as uh, we could be. And secondly, um, well, we just don't want to use graph paper. Uh, we will want to manipulate the formula in order to uh, be able to solve for x. That's the objective, solve for x. We enter this algorithm with a uniform 0, 1 random number. And we exit the algorithm. The output from the algorithm is the value of x. And then we go and do it again. Um, so the first step is that's the cumulative distribution for the exponential. <clears throat> the second step is to take the 1 to the other side. But if f of x is a number between 0 and 1, then 1 minus f of x is also a number between 0 and 1. Um, so that's, that's where we put the random number in. And now the random number is on the left side of the equation. The right-hand side is, is paired down to just um, e raised to the power of negative lambda times x. Uh, and step four, step five are all intermediate algebraic steps uh, to turn everything around and just solve for x. And we do that in step six. Um, and uh, now we have something we can use for repeatedly. We get we have, we're coming in with a, a stream of random numbers between zero and one. We want to generate a stream of exponential random values. So each random number that comes in goes into that formula and out comes, voila, out comes an x. This is to remind you of the relationship between the Poisson and the exponential distribution. Uh, the Poisson is a discrete distribution. The exponential is a continuous distribution. And we, we run into these a lot in um, discrete event simulations. Uh, suppose we know that on average, four customers arrive at our system, whatever it is, per hour. Well, that almost exactly fits the definition of a Poisson process. Uh, discrete events in a continuous inter interval. Um, so th this 4 must be lambda, the parameter of the Poisson process, um, which is not a function and, and, and doesn't change. It's a stationary Poisson process. Um, so that, that we look at the units. If um, the units on lambda is customers per hour, uh, then that works for the Poisson process. If we, if lambda is 4, then 1 over lambda is 1 over 4, and the units on that are hours per arrival. So the average inter-arrival time is a quarter of an hour or 15 minutes per arrival. That would have to be the mean of the exponential distribution. That's why generally, especially in, in simulation, when we use the Poisson and the exponential so much, uh, we'll often use different um, designations, different notation for them, and we'll call lambda the mean of the Poisson distribution and mu the mean of the exponential distribution. But the, the notation is not uniform, so you really just take a look at the units, listen to the words, you have to know what, what's being talked about here. In this example, we're using the inverse transform method to sample from a, a, a distribution that's discrete. It's a customer arrival distribution, and it's an empirical distribution. In other words, we're just using the data uh, as it is, and we're calling that the distribution. The, we, we've, we've collected some data, um, and we found out the proportion um, that how it's, we found out how the data is distributed, 
It's, it, we don't, we're not giving it a name. We're not trying to fit it to any theoretical distribution. We're just using it as is. Um, so here in this case, customers arrive, uh, and these are 10 minute intervals, um, where we have a probability of 0.4, 40% chance of getting zero customers in any 10 minute interval, 25% chance of one customer, 20% chance of two customers, 15% chance of three customers. That's the distribution. It's a discrete probability distribution where we're enumerating, listing the possible outcomes, the probability of each outcome. And in this case, because we need it, we're also uh, indicating the cumulative probability where we just add one to the, the previous one. The probability, uh, the cumulative probability of zero is 0.4. The cumulative probability of one includes the probability of one and the probability of zero. Uh, so it's 0 0.4 plus 0 0.25 is 0 0.65 and so on. So the cumulative probability of three includes all of the other probabilities and uh, that's the totality, that's one. With this discrete empirical distribution, uh, the cumulative distribution looks like steps and that's typically what you'll see. Um, and but the when you plot it out, uh, the x-axis um, contains the, the the value, the x value, number of customers arriving. Uh, the y-axis is uh, the probability, the cumulative probability. So it's a number between zero and one. Um, and uh, we can do the same thing. You if you use the inverse transform method. You generate a random number, uniform zero one. Figure out, look at look at it on the graph. Hang a, a, a horizontal line till it bumps into the curve. Then hang a vertical line to get the x value uh, that that you got. Um, so, for instance, if the random numbers that we generated are 0 0.09, 0 0.54, and so on. Well, for 0 0.09, anything between 0 and 0 0.4 will be 0. So that, that's a 0 um, in the first time period. In the second time period, 0 0.54 uh, gives you a 1. 0 0.42, slightly above 0 0.4, also gives you a 1. Uh, in, the, in the fourth time period, we get a 0.8. And that matches uh, to the, the X value of two, two customers arriving in that time period. And then in the fifth time period, we go back down to zero. And so we've pretty simply um, used what with the exponential looked rather complicated, uh, but in this, this distribution, it, it, since it's discrete and, and uh, we're just looking at a, a simple, a fairly simple distribution. Um, it doesn't present any any intellectual challenges for us at all. At least I hope not. Uh, but we're going to look at uh, something soon that's uh, that will give us a challenge. All right, one of our favorite distributions, the normal distribution. We know so much about it. It should be easy as pie to sample uh, from the normal distribution and generate. Uh, normal variates. Uh, let's see. First of all, before even going further, we're going to forget about the normal distribution and stick to the standard normal uh, because it, it's, it's been studied. We don't need to uh, de derive any formulas. We don't need to create it all over again for every single pair of uh, mu and sigma. Uh, the standard normal is usually called z. z is distributed as normal with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Great. Uh, but of course, that's not really what we want to generate values from. Still, if we can generate the z's, that's great because we could take any z um, and uh, transform it back into an x, uh, solving for x again using algebra. So that's, I guess that's a side note so that we're just to say when we're talking about the normal distribution and sampling from a normal distribution, we're really talking about the standard normal because it's a very easy transformation to go back and forth between what we'll call X and Z. 
Uh, the probability density function for the standard normal distribution is given in the middle of the slide. Um, it's rather complicated, but it's not that terrible. Uh, it's 1 over the square root of 2 pi times e raised to a power of negative 1 half times x squared. The formula for the cumulative uh, probability distribution of the standard normal is um, a little bit more uh, complicated and not something we would really want to work with algebraically to solve for x. In fact, it's pretty frightening. Um, using the graphical solution, I suppose, would be an answer because the graph is a regular S graph typical of um, you know, symmetric mean equals median equals mode uh, distributions like the normal. Uh, but again, the graphical, using the graphical approach is um, very inefficient and time consuming and it's hard to, um, to generate a computer program to do it. Uh, so do we really want to use the inverse transfer method here? Probably not. Thankfully, there are a lot of other alternatives. I'm going to show you one on the next couple of slides. There are different methods that are used for sampling from a normal distribution. Uh, here I'm going to present to you one that's usually called very simply the sampling method, and you'll see why pretty soon. Um, it's an easy to explain method. It's an interesting one to look at. Probably not one that's actually going to be used because it's not terribly efficient. Uh, we'll look at the, some of its deficiencies uh, after I show you the technique. Uh, this method is based on the central limit theorem. So recall the central limit theorem um, says that sums or averages uh, of distributions that are not normal, as long as they're symmetric, they very quickly become come to look like a normal distribution um, as the, su the number of items that you're summing, the number of variables that you're summing together, uh, as that number gets larger and larger and larger. Um, so here's, look at this example here. We're looking at a very, very simple um, probability distribution tossing a die. When you toss a die, you can get an um, outcome, uh, the number that's on the face of the die, either a one or a two or three, a four, a five or six, they're all equally likely. So the probability of any one of those outcomes is one six. That's a typical rectangular distribution um, and it's, it's a, a uniform distribution. Uh, but what happens if we uh, toss the die twice and the outcome we're looking at is the sum or the average of the two outcomes from the two tosses? Or what happens if we to toss the die three times or four times and so on? Well, it so happens uh, that um, in the first case, you will start ending up with a rectangular distribution. And a rectangular distribution is not that much different from the normal. It needs some smoothing out, uh, but it's certainly symmetric. The mean is equal to the median is equal to the mode and so on. Um, but what happens as you toss the die more and more times and accumulate the sums over that number of times, this distribution does, in fact, uh, start to look very much like it has a bell-shaped curve. Well, as you know, it's not enough uh, just to know that you're creating uh, this uh, normal distribution by sampling from, let's say, a uniform distribution. Uh, but it's nice to know you can do that. But you also have to know what the, the mean and the standard deviation is, uh, because what we really want is the standard normal distribution. So we at least have to be able to figure out what are the parameters of this normal distribution that we're counting on having sampled uh, because we're summing the values generated from a uniform 0, 1 distribution. Um, well, as far as the mean goes, um, if for any uniform uh, from A to B uh, distribution, we know that the mean is one half A plus B. So for the specific case of the uniform zero one, the expected value or the mean is going to be one half 
uh, 0 plus 1, or 1 half, 0.5. Uh, the, we know that the expected value of the sum of two random variables is the sum of the expected values. Uh, the expected value of x plus y is equal to the expected value of x plus the expected value of y. And by extension, if we have more than two random uh, values from, this, from these random variables, um, then we can add those as well. So the method goes like this. Let's say we have 12. What would happen if we have had 12? Well, for a um, random number from a uniform 0, 1 distribution, the mean is 0.5 and 1 half. Um, so what happens if we have 12? Well, it's 1 half plus 1 half plus 1 half 12 times. So in other words, the mean will be 6. If we sample repeatedly 12 times from a uniform 0, 1 distribution, we'll have something approaching a normal distribution. We'll have an approximation of a normal distribution with a mean of 6. Now, what about the variance? Using the same uh, tools that we did for um, the mean, uh, the variance of a uniform 0, 1 distribution reduces to 1 over 12, 1 twelfth. Um, if you, when you sum variances, or when you get, well, if you want the variance of a sum, you can also uh, sum the variances, just like we did with the mean, and that's a nice feature. Um, so for 2, it would be um, 2 times um, the variance. For 12, it would be 12 times the variance. Um, that's one good reason with, for using 12. Uh, 12 times 1 twelfth is 1. If the variance is 1, the standard deviation is 1, and we're halfway to a standard normal distribution. Finally, here's where we draw it all together. What's the actual process for using this sampling method to generate values from a, a normal uh, distribution? Well, the first thing we do, we start with our typical um, uniform 0, 1 generator. Uh, we get 12 of those, add them up, and then subtract the number 6. Why? Because we need the mean to be 0. Um, the variance is already 0. The standard deviation is already 0. So once we're finished with step 2, we have um, a value for, generated from the Z distribution, the standard normal with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Step three is then simply using the transform algorithm to go from an X, from a Z to an X, um, using whatever the parameters from the normal distribution that we're interested in that we started out with. Um, and that's that's it. It's done. It's very, very simple. It's not great, but at least it's simple, easy to do, easy to understand. Okay, so what's so not great about it? Well, the fact that we're limiting ourselves to 12, summing 12 uh, random numbers in order to get a value from a normal distribution, even if um, it's a decent approximation, um, we're, we're limiting the values that it can take on. And sometimes we do want to sample from very low probability values in the extremes, and this won't be very amenable. This method won't work very well for that. And in addition, I mean really, 12 random numbers for every normal random variate. Uh, we're going to run through our uh, random number generators uh, period uh, very, very quickly. So we, then in addition, we need a pseudo-random number generator that doesn't start cycling too quickly. What do we use all of this for in simulation? Uh, we use this in order to generate values to, that are used as input to the simulation. Uh, if we have customers coming into a bank, we need to generate um, inter-arrival times. Uh, we, if we have a um, machine shop, we need to generate the time until the, a machine goes out of service for whatever reason. Um, so these are the inputs to the simulation. 
uh, this all assumes that we know the distribution we want to sample from. And that's a whole other lecture, and that's what's coming up next.